to the first public lecture of the Center for Evangelicalism and Culture, which most of you have not heard about, but will be hearing more about. I also want to welcome Dr. Peter Berger, who has become a good friend. Peter is known for many things. He's been writing for many years, and many of his books address different issues that have appeared for you students in your classes uh, that have shaped also cultural thinking. Uh, so some people continue to identify uh, Peter with secularization theory, even though he spent a lot of time trying to help people see that that is not the way to think about modernity. I encourage you to look at his book out on the table, The Many Altars of Modernity, and to um, purchase it <laughs> if you'd like. The Many Altars of Modernity, and the theme of which is pluralism. In this book, Peter is um, addressing what pluralism means for our culture, a different way to think about the world in which we live. He and I are continuing to work on some ideas that are subsequent to this, and I'm excited that he'll be presenting some of these ideas today. Um, this book does not address theological issues, and he will address those for you. I'm also delighted to welcome um, Peter Berger. He is serving as our visiting distinguished scholar for the year 2015 to 2016. That means he'll be on campus more. I know that he will be meeting with JAF fellows. He'll be responding to some other uh, talks that we have. So I look forward to his presence here. So thank you, Peter, for coming. Thank you, what? I think you're all set. Can you hear me? Yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, he asked me what, how she should introduce me. I said, as briefly as possible, but to leave out my career in the Montana State Prison. I will not tell you for what <laughs> felony I was there. Uh, this is a rather lengthy. I'm going to leave out a paragraph or so along the way, but I hope I will not bore you. <laughs> Many observers of the contemporary world still think that we live in a secular age. The assumption is that modernity necessarily pushes religion toward the margins of society and of the consciousness of individuals. Some who think uh, this way welcome the alleged fact. Uh, they are in the traditions of the Enlightenment, which celebrated the victory of reason over religious superstition. I suppose a climax of this tendency was the, the celebration uh, when the French revolutionary crowned a street walker as the goddess of reason in the solemnly desacralized Church of the Madeleine in Paris. Others agree with the assumption about the fact of secularization, but deplore rather than welcome it. Thus the Pope calls for a new evangelism to reconvert to the faith what has become a godless world, especially but not only in Europe. Uh, I don't want to disagree with the Pope, but I have to, <laughs> at least on this issue. Well, some others too, including, come to think of it, his position, but that's his, his job. <laughs> the, assumption, <laughs> the assumption of our secular age came to be known as secularization theory. And there were some good reasons for it, which dominated the study of contemporary religion by the middle of the 20th century, when, as some of you know, uh, well, when I started my career as a sociologist. I usually tell people I started it, and I think how old I am with the time of Lincoln's second inaugural, but actually it was slightly later than that. Uh, it took me some 20 years to come to the conclusion that the empirical evidence does not support the theory. Most of the world today is as religious as it ever was, in places more so. I would like to emphasize that this change of mind on my part was not caused by some kind of religious conversion. My religious position, a theologically open-minded Lutheranism, has not changed during my adult life. What changed was my reading of the empirical evidence. My Lutheranism will pop up a couple of times in the comments I will make this afternoon. Obviously, the question arises, if secularization theory must be given up, what could take its place? After more years, some more years, it occurred to me that what should replace it is a theory of pluralism. We don't live in a secular age, 
by the way, some of you probably know Charles Taylor's book, A Secular Age, which succeeds in uh, continuing the mistake of the title for about 800 pages. We don't live in a secular <laughs> age. We live in an, in an age of pluralism. We live in a pluralist age. This greatly affects the place of religion in society and in the lives of individuals. It constitutes a challenge for faith, but is a different one from the assumed challenge of secularity. In 2014, I published a book that made a first step at a new theory. Uh, Kay was kind enough to wave it around. Um, please buy 10 copies each of the book. <laughs> Uh, it is called The Many Altars of Modernity Toward a Paradigm for Religion in a Pluralist Age. That book was an exercise in sociological analysis without any religious presuppositions. There cannot be a Christian sociology any more than a Christian chemistry or a Christian dental surgery. Uh, I could have written the same book as a Buddhist, an atheist, or whatever. However, it so happens that I am a Christian believer, concerned with the implications of my findings for my faith. So this paper, unlike the one that some of you punishing yourself heard some months ago here, uh, what this paper is is a theological reflection about my sociological findings. It can be summed up to my as a suggestion to my fellow believers, do not be afraid of pluralism, it is good for you. And I will end up my observations by giving you what I think are three important reasons why pluralism is good for faith. I suppose that our age is actually marked by two pluralisms. There is religious pluralism, as commonly understood, which basically means several religions coexisting more or less peacefully in the same society. Then there is the coexistence between religious discourses and the powerful secular discourse originally rooted in modern science and technology. Its power comes from the enormously successful way in which scientifically based technology has changed the human condition mostly for the better. Critics of modernity should reflect on the fact that in pre-modern societies most children died before the age of five. Today, even in poor countries, most children live into adulthood. I think stated most briefly is why modernity is not to be condemned. Uh, secularization theory was not completely wrong in that it recognizes the importance of the secular discourse. It just greatly exaggerated its capacity to push out religious discourses. It doesn't. Religion and secularity are often seen as being essentially antagonistic. That may be true of a very small portion of people, those totally committed to either faith or its denial. For most religious people, it is a matter of, not a matter of either or, but rather of both and. Ah, I'm gonna this is too, too, never mind. Next paragraph, forget it. <laughs> Probably, there has always been a distinction between sacred and profane activities. Modernity has led to a great expansion of the space allowed for secularity, not only due to the role of science and technology. Hugo, Gro Hugo Grotius, that's G-R-O-T-I-U-S, somebody I discovered rather recently. His dates were 1583 to 1646, a Dutch jurist who was one of the founders of modern international law. Uh, he proposed that this new discipline should be developed, and he, I guess he wrote, he wrote in Latin, the phrase he used, as if God did not exist, sit et si Deus non daretur, that is without any religious presuppositions. He hardly had a choice. Europe in, this, Europe in this time was divided between states defined as Catholic or Protestant and different varieties of Protestantism, as well as Eastern Orthodox Russia and the Muslim Ottoman Empire. 
if a law intended to cover all of this had to be free of any particular religious presuppositions. It should be noted that if Grotius' formula is to be called atheistic, it is a methodological atheism rather than a philosophical one. Grotius was a profoundly pious Protestant belonging to the Arminian branch of the Dutch Reformation. I would call it a more humane branch of the Dutch Reformation. It basically rejected the Calvinist doctrine of double predestination. Uh, one can see, uh, well, if I, in fact, uh, he was driven out, of the, the Calvinists at that time were in, in charge of the newly independent Netherlands, and they, I don't know whether they kicked him out or whether he decided to leave, but anyway, he left the Netherlands and went into exile in uh, part of Germany, a Lutheran part of Germany, which was at least relatively tolerant. One can see very clearly how pluralism on an international scale, which was the one he operated on, uh, opened up a space for secular discourse in domestic affairs. The same happened in the Netherlands a little later. Grotius could then have stayed at home. Well, uh, there was no great uh, religious pluralism within the Netherlands at the time, but as, as independent Netherlands expanded, it included the South, which was mainly Catholic, still is. And uh, if law was to cover both parts of the country, it had to be without religious presuppositions because neither Catholic nor Protestant ones would do. And so the Netherlands became, and they had very urgent problems. They had two basic problems. One was to avoid Spain from reconquering the Netherlands, and the other one was the Atlantic Ocean flooding the whole country. So they had to build these dams and waterways and so forth, and it didn't matter whether you were Protestant or Catholic, you had to collaborate or you'd either be killed by the Inquisition or drown in the sea. Um, pluralism on the international scale opened up a space for secular discourse for very practical reasons. Needless to say, religious institutions, the churches in Christian Europe had to find ways to accept these secular spaces, even if they had theological qualms, unless they were to engage in ongoing religious warfare, which they did for a good part of the 17th century, as you may recall. Like an in incredible uh, percentage of the population of Europe was killed during the Thirty Years' War between Protestants and Catholics all over Central Europe. And one of the basic political mandates of all European states, Protestant or Catholic, was never again must this be allowed to happen. One of the theological que questions raised by pluralism for faith, both of the churches and for individuals, is how to accept the secular spaces. Different Christian churches have different ways of doing this. The Roman Catholic Church can use its long tradition of natural law, which is supposedly relevant both to the, to the, to the, uh, the revealed truth in the custody of the church and to the universal moral principles supposedly inscribed in all human hearts. The Reformed tradition has difficulty accepting secular spaces with its all-encompassing en en encompassing notion, encompassing notion of a Christian commonwealth for example, in New England or in South Africa. However, one of the most interesting modern Reformed theologians, Abraham Kuyper, K-U-Y-P-E-R, made a vigorous attempt uh, at this difference with the idea of sphere sovereignty. Sphere sovereignty was his phrase. Not every area of social life must be directly governed in every detail by the ultimate sovereignty of Christ. In addition to being a very conservative Calvinist theologian, Kuyper was also a practical politician, prime minister of the Netherlands, 1901 to 1905, who devised the original Dutch invention of the system of pillars by which every denomination and worldview was allocated its own zone of publicly supported influence. On my first visit to the Netherlands, I was a young man at the time, I went for a walk, it was in Rotterdam, uh, and came on a building which had a sign outside which said Protestant Electricians Union. That was the doing of Kuiper. Probably down the block there was a Catholic <laughs> uh, Electricians Union and then they added a humanist 
uh, electricians union, which were those who didn't belong to any church. Lutherans have developed their own theological rationale for accepting uh, secular spaces by their sharp distinction between law and gospel, the doctrine of the two realms, succinctly expressed by Luther in his saying, I'd rather be ruled by a just Turk than by an unjust Christian. There are different theological ideas capable of inspiring formulas of peace between different religions and value systems in pluralist situations, from the convivencia of Muslims, Christians, and Jews during the better years of Muslim rule in Spain. There were also bad years, but the good ones, they lived together very peacefully for quite a while. To the separation of religion and the state in the First Amendment to the US Constitution, which of course presupposes a secular space in the law. Uh, when we have to open the newspaper almost any day because much litigation in federal state and federal courts, uh, it goes around First Amendment interpretation like this woman in, where was it, in Kentucky who was put in jail because she wouldn't issue uh, same-sex marriage licenses and obviously raises the religion of religious freedom. Um, anyway, uh, the, the kind of religious freedom which the U.S. Constitution guarantees uh, is, is a, a formula of peace. It makes, allows people to live together in peace despite enormous religious or theological differences. Now, I would add an important corollary to this, and that's as a sociologist. If secular spaces are to be allowed in society, they must also be allowed in individual consciousness. Put differently, if the First Amendment is to function in American society, and has functioned extremely well, by the way, for quite a while, well, since it went on the books, there must be its miniaturized version in the minds of citizens. If a federal judge in Kentucky has to decide whether this poor woman in, in the registry office is entitled to First Amendment protection or not, he cannot argue on the basis of his religious faith. Regardless of what his faith is, he must go by the law, which is secular by definition, because it cannot, it doesn't have any religious presuppositions. Individuals can give a religious interpretation to it, of course. There are many ways of having theological reasons for religious freedom, I'm happy to say. Uh, but the judge cannot take those into consideration. He must go by precedent, by statute, etc. How is this possible? All religions from the most primitive to the most sophisticated deal with the ultimate concerns of the human condition. Certainly Christian faith does. However, there are many penultimate concerns that must be addressed in the business of living. I think that the social theorist of theory of Alfred Schütz, 1900 to 1959, has produced some useful concepts to analyze how different ultimate and penultimate multiple realities coexist in the mind. Schütz was my teacher, my, one of my first teachers in sociology, but uh, he was totally uninterested in religion himself, but these concepts are very nicely applied to religion. Um, there's even, and this is even in the case with individuals who believe to have direct contact with divine or supernatural realities. In such experiences, <clears throat> the reality of everyday life, should call this the paramount reality, fades away and the individual enters a truly different world. Take, for example, one of the great mystics in the Catholic tradition, Teresa of Avila, 1515 to 1582, whose encounters with God certainly tore her out of ordinary reality. However, Teresa, along with her friend San Juan de la Cruz, was very active reforming the Carmelite order in Spain. In pursuit of this task, I assume that she periodically examined the financial accounts of the convents under her direction. It is very difficult to do arithmetic while in the throes of spiritual ecstasy, <coughs> and vice versa. For most ordinary believers who don't have supernatural experiences, another Schutzian concept is more applicable, relevant structure, relevant structure. 
religious actions and ideas coexist with secular ones without necessarily colliding. As far as I know, uh, Pope Francis I is not a mystic, so he can more easily than Teresa switch religious and secular relevance. And I recently, actually I haven't used this before this lecture, so you're the first one to hear this brilliant example. Uh, imagine the Pope in his Pope mobile, this white little car that looks like a golf vehicle, and he's on his way to a really religious, supernatural activity on, on, his, on his job. He's declared the sanctification of some, I don't know, Brazilian nun somewhere, which actually extends his jurisdiction from this world to the next. Uh, now people, she's, a, she's officially a saint, people, this nun, people can pray to her, she's performed miracles, she can perform some more. So there he is in his little golf cart, and it breaks down. This happens even to pap papal vehicles. Uh, the Vatican must have a fairly large garage, with so quite a few vehicles. It also has, I know this, an office of exorcism. When the Pope mobile breaks down, whom do, he, whom do his aides call? The garage or the exorcist? Uh, I I, I, I'm sure it's the garage. That doesn't mean that the Pope doesn't believe he can sanctify Brazilian nuns uh, or that there are miracles. But at that moment, there is a business at hand which is, doesn't include any of these religious beliefs. Uh, he's got to fix the car, which he can't do, and he needs a technician who could do it. Modern people have to develop this distinction between uh, religious and secular discourses. Uh, more than to a very high degree because social life has become very complex. Lots of relevant structures uh, have to be na navigated through even in a single day. If I were teaching a class, we could have great fun figuring out all the relevant structures which people bring into this situation. Official ones as a college seminar and unofficial ones, what really goes on in their mind and what really happens. Different relevant structures, different relevances, if you use, want to use a short, shorter term. Pluralism vastly increases the multiplicity of relevant structures. Religion is no exception to this development. Um, I think I will skip this paragraph. Uh, an aside, uh, I want to leave some time for questions or whatnot. There are Good reasons why religious belief, believers in any tradition should be disturbed by the challenge of pluralism. It is a real challenge. And if you want, this is an evangelical school, so you want a biblical reference, I can give it to you. It's the obvious one, the story in the book of Acts of Paul's sermon in Athens, which begins by Paul observing how the Athenians must be very, I'm sure you all know this in, in this college, um, Paul observes that this must be very religious people. They have all these different gods, uh, altars de 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 dedicated to them. And he saw one that said to an unknown god, and this as yet unknown god he will now proclaim to them. Um, my point in this article, which I will skip, since I understand you don't want to be here until midnight. I, I got this note. Um, uh, the Athenians were apparently intrigued by this message. At least two of them apparently were convinced or were converted. They and all the other converts who followed had to, cho had to choose to follow this Jesus, this unknown God. Christian faith was totally new. There was no Christian tradition to fall back upon. It was in any way taken for granted. Uh, they had to make a choice. And on a different level of sophistication, it can be very different levels. It can be a very philosophical level. It can be a very simple, unsophisticated level. People facing different religions uh, must somehow figure out which they really want to belong to. The one into which they were born, the one in which they had some experience of conversion, or maybe none of those. They're going to live suspended in, in the, before the question. And uh, you get this all the time. Um, somebody's asked uh, for their religious affiliation, and you often get, when you get more than a question in a survey ticked off, and you get people to say, and they get answers like, I happen to be Catholic, 
My grandmother still goes to mass every morning. Uh, my father doesn't go to church at all. I think he believes in nothing. Uh, uh, my wife is Episcopalian, and my daughter is, is, is that dating a Jew. Uh, that's my situation. Well, in that situation, you have to figure out where you stand. And you don't have to be a philosopher uh, or a theologian. Uh, fortunately, most people in the world are not intellectuals who want some kind of coherent picture of the world. Or well, at least they think it's coherent. But they still have to decide how to navigate the situation. And that involves choices. And uh, my question is, it involved choices in the beginning of Christian history. It had to, because there was nothing to fall back upon in terms of tradition. You couldn't be born a Christian. You had to become a Christian. Why should we bemoan the situation of the early church, which is so similar to our own? And my first is not yet one of my three basic reasons why pluralism is good for you, but it's one reason to make you think. Why is this so bad? Uh, it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, maybe it's good enough for us. Well, Apostle Paul apparently had a vision of Christ on the road to Damascus, which most of us have not had, certainly I haven't. But uh, still, the environment, social environment in which he worked was very similar to ours. Now I will now skip two paragraphs. Back to, I'm, I'm just giving examples. I'm such an intelligent audience, you can make up your own examples. Back to a theological defense of pluralism. Now, now we get to the gist of my talk. I have now given an overview of the pluralistic context in which faith finds itself today. I will propose that there are three theological benefits from this context. One, a new insight into the nature of faith. Also, a new insight into the nature of the Christian church. And thirdly, a way of distinguishing the core of the faith from its more peripheral aspects, which I think is the most important, so I will end with it. Number one a new insight into the nature of faith in the context of pluralism. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3.28 speaks of being justified by faith without the works of the law. This was deliberately amplified by Luther who sneaked in the word alone into his translation of the phrase, by faith alone. Uh, his, he was pretty, had pretty good Greek. He, it was not that he couldn't translate the <laughs> sentence accurately, and I don't think he deliberately meant to deceive people as to what Paul said. Uh, rather, he thought that the amplification was in accord, in accord with Paul's basic intention, which was freeing the Christian faith from the obedience of the Jewish law. That was not Luther's problem in the 16th century. But he now put this in a new context, that of freeing the faith from what he thought was the legalism of the Roman church. He called it works righteousness as against the righteousness of faith. This sola fide became the battle cry of the Protestant Reformation against Rome. But I don't think that today we have to be stuck with a polemical understanding of either Jewish or Roman legalism. I think that we can have a new insight today into the meaning of sola fide. And you don't have to be a Lutheran to have that insight because of our contemporary pluralistic context. The phrase, can now, the phrase can now be understood as an acceptance of the loss of certainty that results from the relativizing effect of pluralism. Another way of putting this, the phrase denotes acceptance of the penumbra of doubt that goes with faith that can no longer be taken for granted. It is very common for preachers in different Christian denominations to counterpose faith and unbelief. The latter is understood as a kind of rebellion against God, or at least or also as a grave sin. I think that this counterposition is misleading. The opposite of faith is not unbelief, it is knowledge. As I write this, I look from the window of my study 
can see from the window of my study, the outline of the, the, the Boston skyline. I know that I'm in Boston when I write this, as I write this, not in New York or London or any other locality. I know that I'm not looking at the Boston skyline now. I'm in, what is it, Wenham, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, a beginning student of philosophy could argue with me, maybe I'm dreaming this, maybe my vision is, is disturbed by an eye disease. Can I really prove that I see what I see from my window is real? I think he and I are playing a game here. There's a classic story of the 18th century conversation between the philosopher Bishop George B Barclay and the famous literateur Dr. Samuel Johnson. They were out on a walk. Some of you probably have heard this story in a philosophy course. They were out for a walk and, <laughs> and uh, Bishop Barclay was explaining uh, to Johnson's increasing irritation that he couldn't prove that anything around them was real. And then Dr. Johnson kicked a stone across the street and said, thus I disprove you. Uh, this is what Schutz calls the paramount reality. There's no way of denying it. You hurt your foot kicking that stone. Uh, <clears throat> I know I'm not in Boston. I know I'm at Gordon College, right? Yeah. Uh, but what else do I know? Do I know, we, every day in the newspaper we read an account of somebody who came out with a machine gun or something and killed uh, a lot of innocent people around him and then later after his arrest and put on trial, his neighbors say he was always such a nice guy, he was friendly with children, we all liked him, he was helpful. Do I know that there's none here of this kind? I don't know. If I could see it, I would not stay here, I would quickly leave. Do I know this? No. I have faith in it. Why do I have faith in it? Um, well, I have a lot to do with college students. Very few of them are likely to be mass murderers. Um, I have faith in the basic civility of higher education in America, at least short of violence. Sometimes it's not so civil on the on this side of violence, but very little real violence goes on. If it does, it makes headlines because it's unusual. Uh, and take another example, my good friend Jack. Uh, I, do I know that he's not a psychopathic murderer who will pull out, pull out a gun one day and kill me? I will probably tell myself that, of course, I cannot know this, but I know enough about him as to have faith in his benevolence. I think that this reflection is very relevant to an understanding of Christian faith. The early Christian faith, one of its major religious uh, alternatives to the pluralistic situation was Gnosticism. For the Gnostics, Christianity, the name indicate, indicates was a form of Gnosis, Greek word for knowledge. You were initiated into this knowledge and then you knew that Christianity was true. And I think that was not what the Christian faith was about and still is about. It's an act of faith in the truth of the gospel. I guess the classical New Testament uh, uh, citation for this is from the letters to the Hebrews, Hebrews 11.1, 1, if you want to look it up. Uh, famous line, faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. Luther made a Latin wordplay to make this point. Faith, fides, fides in Latin, is trust, fiducia. Trust in the goodness of God disclosed by Jesus Christ. Luther also remarked once, he was close to the end of his life, I don't really know what I believe. I know in whom I believe. That's a very interesting sentence. I'm not glorifying Luther, some ugly sides to Luther, especially as he became older, he became a very mean character, but that's another story. I still think he had some very important insights into the nature of Christian faith. Okay, so much for the first benefit. Second benefit of pluralism. Coming to terms with churches as voluntary associations. 
Almost all Christian churches have in the past made aggressive, if not exclusive, claims regarding the truth of their particular version of Christianity. Very often, the same churches had been established by the state in the past and now find it difficult to do without this kind of support. No longer can one rely on the state to fill one's pews. Lay people have to be persuaded to sit in the pews and what's sitting there to keep on sitting. The change, this changes the relationship between clergy and laity. Inevitably, the latter become more powerful. It also changes the relationship between churches from potential opponents in religious conflict to competitors in what is essentially a free market. And finally, it changes the relationship between uh, uh, the churches and the state because the state has to manage this pluralism and has to find ways of doing this. And there are different formulas of peace, as I've called this. Uh, separation of church and state is not the only one. I would argue it's the most effective one, it's the most practical one. And uh, the American form is not the only one, there are others very different, for example, the French one. But religious freedom means that all these different religions can coexist, practice their religion, and uh, not engage in open conflict. Uh, and the American one has been remarkably successful. It's been going on successfully for, for what, 200 years or so, more than 200 years. And uh, uh, there are always disputes. We have lots of disputes right now, almost inevitable. Always disputes between different rights and obligations. But I think the only, the only major, there are lots of crimes in American history, the history of every country, crimes against blacks, against American Indians. But in terms of religion, the one exception <laughs> to the success of American religious pluralism, the separation of church and state, have been the Mormons. And uh, they, they, people just couldn't take the Mormons, whether it was a polygamy or whether it was the uh, rather strange story of the origins of Mormonism and Joseph Smith's uh, experiences. But they couldn't take it. And when uh, uh, the Mormons wanted to, they established their commonwealth in Utah, and when they wanted to become a state, Congress wouldn't have it unless they got a secondary revelation. Mormons fortunately have a body of elders, I think they are called, some such title, which are in continuous relationship with God. Uh, only ones, I believe, not the ordinary Mormon believer. And they got a new revelation that polygamy is, is, is a no-no and, and monogamy is what everyone should have. And then Congress said, come in, <laughs> another state. Uh, so a very successful, a very successful, uh, uh, experience. Um, um, Richard Niebuhr, and not the theologian, his brother, the Yale historian, wrote a book in 1929 called The Social Sources of Denominationalism, in which he suggested the uh, social study of religion had classically distinguished between churches and sects. Church is a large body in which you are born, a sect, sect is a compact little group uh, which you join. Well, it doesn't really apply to America at all. Uh, the, the big groups in America have churches, they have all the, all the characteristics of the church, but yet you join them, you have to decide to stay there. And then uh, Niebuhr suggested the third concept, which probably is of American origin, I think, linguistically, maybe it already existed in England, the denomination. The denomination is a church which is a competition, peaceful competition with other churches, and at least legally recognizes their right to exist. Um, now, one thing I'm going to omit, though it's, it, maybe I shouldn't, no, I, I will omit it. I don't want to talk too long. Uh, the most interesting case of a church that had a very hard time accepting this fact is the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, uh, I went into some detail here, but I will skip this. If you take the 100-year period between the First Vatican Council and the Second Vatican Council, it was a dramatic change. Because the Roman Church never admits that it's changing. It's always the same, new understanding. Okay, if you're not a Roman Catholic, you put a question mark behind that assumption. But um, uh, the First Vatican Council, 1860s, 
uh, ended in 1870, uh, was under the, it was convoked by Pius the uh, Ninth, a ultra conservative theologian, and the basic assumption was still error has no rights. Uh, the Catholic Church has a deposit of revealed truth in its custody, and it must have the right to proclaim that truth, but other people may be tolerated, but they have no right to their mistakes. Uh, Second Vatican Council, uh, which ended in 1965, uh, I would say probably its most significant, at least socially, politically significant declaration, was the Declaration on Religious Freedom, called Dignitatis Humanae, Human Dignity, interesting title on, uh, on that uh, statement on religious freedom, which proclaimed religious freedom as a fundamental human right of all human beings, not just Catholics, but everybody, even those with no religion at all. Religious freedom protects religious pluralism but pluralism also provides the political rationality, if not the necessity, of religious freedom. And that's a great good. I do agree with, with, with Vatican II on this one, not on other statements coming out of Rome. Um, specifically, the secular, religiously neutral space that pluralism op opens up can be used as the most practical setting for the political management of pluralism, generally much more humane and less costly than repression. Okay, now we come to the climax. You hope you're ready for the climax. Finally, the relativization third benefit of pluralism to faith. Finally, the relativization of taken for granted religion which pluralism brings about leads to a process I call cognitive bargaining. As I converse with others who do not share my worldview, we influence each other. Only rarely does this lead to conversion in either direction. I don't surrender my worldview to theirs and they don't surrender to mine. Well, of course, this does happen. More commonly, there is a give and take. I'll let you have X, but I'll stick to Y. This has what I think is a very positive outcome. I am forced, even if I'm not at all inclined toward philosophical thinking, I'm forced to distinguish the non-negotiable core of my faith from more peripheral features that I'm prepared to let go. There is a wonderful story about the great Rabbi Hillel the Elder, 110 before Christ to 10 after Christ, one of the founders of rabbinical Judaism. He was once asked in mockery, I suspect, whether he could explain the meaning of Torah while standing on one foot. He said yes, and then recited the first recorded formulation of the golden rule, the way he put it, don't do others what you hate when it's being done to you. Christians generally think that as reported in the New Testament, this sense was invented by Jesus. More likely, given the chronology, Jesus was quoting Hillel. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> with all due respect to the great rabbi, I think that Hillel made a poor choice since the sentence he <laughs> pronounced on one uh, uh, leg uh, refers to the second tablet of the law, the one that deals with relations with other people rather than the relation with God. It seems to me that he would have been better advised to recite the Shema, the one sentence proclaiming the faith of Israel, which has been on the lips of so many pious Jews as they face death. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Be this as it may, after reciting his standing on one leg, on one foot sentence, Hillel added the profound afterward, the rest is commentary. Very powerful sentence. Commentary in terms of rabbinical Judaism has come for many centuries through today. Uh, rabbinical Judaism is a religion of argument. You keep arguing, turning it this way and that way. It could be this, it could be that way. Muslims, possibly describable as the spiritual great-grandchildren of Hillel, would have no difficulty in coming up with a one core sentence 
explaining their faith, the Shahada. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. One sentence, one leg. What about Christianity? Can we have a Christian core sentence, which under no circumstances will we give up, uh, distinguishing from what we might give up? <clears throat> I think the core message of the gospel concerns the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the one miracle that however interpreted, however comment, commentary prone, is non-negotiable. To say this, of course, raises a lot of commentary questions. Who was Jesus? Was there an empty tomb after Jesus rose from the dead? Put differently, if a police camera had been installed in the tomb, what would, have shown as, what would it have shown as the body of Jesus disappeared? What was the nature of the body of the risen Christ? If the New, Testament account, the New Testament accounts clearly show it as different from simply a revived corpse, as a very distinctive kind of body. And what, perhaps most important, what is the consequence of the resurrection for, of Christ for the future of all human beings and indeed for the future of the entire unredeemed cosmos? God, I think, most majestically in the words of the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Easter liturgy, liturgy, as the risen Christ trampled death with death. Wonderful formula. It was the end of death. Once again, I take my cue from the Apostle Paul. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. The Christian Shema, or the Christian Shahada, if you like, the Muslim parallel, is one sentence. Christ is risen. The rest is commentary. But what about all the other miracles recounted in the New Testament? For example, did Jesus walk on the water in the Sea of Galilee? If he was who he said he was, which I believe, I cannot exclude this possibility but neither am I constrained to affirm it. My faith is certainly not vain without this story. I will conclude with a story from the happily defunct Soviet Union. <laughs> Periodically, the Communist Party conduct, conducted campaigns to promote, promote scientific atheism. During one such campaign, all the inhabitants of a village, including the Orthodox priest, had to assemble for a one-hour lecture by a party official about the truth of atheism and the illusions of religion. When he was finished, the official said, we believe in free speech here. The hell they did. The priest will have five minutes for rebuttal. The priest came up front and said, I don't need five minutes. Then he turned to the assembled villagers and said, Christ is risen. The villagers responded with a proper liturgical response. He is risen indeed. The villager, the, the priest, then returned to where he had stood among the villagers. Thank you. <laughs>